Welcome back to Hoosier History, Legends, and Heroes. In this video, we will be revisiting the 1800s. We will be going back once again to the Civil War. The Civil War started on April 12, 1861 and ended on May 9, 1865. In our previous video about Indiana and the Battle of Antietam, we talked about the 27th Indiana Infantry. In this video, we will be talking about the 9th Indiana Infantry. The 9th Indiana Volunteer Infantry Regiment was organized on April 22, 1861 for a three-month service in Indianapolis. It was then reorganized for a three-year service in late August and early September of 1861. The 9th took part in many major battles of the Civil War, such as Shiloh, Lookout Mountain, Kennesaw Mountain, and the Siege of Atlanta. Jacob Miller was born on August 14, 1838 in Vermilion County, Indiana. He enlisted in the Union Army on September 5, 1861. At the time of his enlistment, his residence was Logansport, Cass County, Indiana. He mustered in on K Company, 9th Indiana Infantry. This paperwork confirms that he was attached to K Company, 9th Indiana, and that his residence was Logansport, Indiana. This is a picture of Jacob Miller when he went to war in 1861. By September of 1863, the 9th Indiana had been involved in several battles of the Civil War. September 18th, Jacob Miller and the 9th Indiana Infantry find themselves at the Battle of Chickamauga in the state of Georgia. The Battle of Chickamauga was a major victory for the Confederate Army. There were two days of savage fighting with the Southern Army breaking through the Union Army lines. Chickamauga was the second bloodiest battle of the Civil War, with Gettysburg being the bloodiest. This was a victory for the South, but at a terrible cost. The Confederate Army lost 20% of its force. On the 18th, the Confederate Army was advancing towards the Union Army, hoping to take the Union Army by surprise. Unknown to the Confederates, they had been spotted, and the Union Army had reinforcements in place ready to face the rebels. There were skirmishes that happened on the 18th, but nothing compared to what was to come. On the morning of Saturday, September 19th, 1863, the battle begins with intense fighting shortly after dawn. Now we will return to Private Jacob Miller. The battle has begun with all its fury. I'm sure he said a prayer like most other soldiers praying to survive another battle. He's surrounded by Union and Confederate soldiers, men of his regiment, gunfire, cannon blasts, surrounded by all the sounds, smells, and horror of battle. Then something happens that changed his life, something that changed his life forever. On this slide, there is a picture of a pontoon bridge, which was used by armies during the war. This would help to move soldiers and wagons and horses across a body of water. They could be quickly put together. Believe it or not, pontoon bridges were still used in World War II. Hardtack was a major staple of soldiers during the Civil War. Hardtack is a hard type of biscuit. It was easy to make, easy to transport, and was long lasting. Since the tack was so hard, it was often soaked in water, coffee, or meat fat to help soften it enough to make it edible. The Civil War also had Teamsters. The Teamsters drove a wagon team of horses or mules. The wagons carried the food for the soldiers and animals, baggage and other supplies, and also the ammunition. And they would also transport the sick or wounded. I wanted to give a little background on these three things because they will be mentioned in the story going forward. This slide shows a military document that states that Jacob had been wounded on September 19, 1863. 
The document also gives casualty information. Jacob had been shot by a Confederate soldier. He was shot in the forehead. I will be sharing Jacob's unbelievable story of survival. There was an article published in an Illinois newspaper in 1911 telling of Jacob's story. After being shot, Jacob was left for dead on the battlefield. When he came to his senses some time later, he found that he was in the rear of the Confederate line. He was terrified of being taken prisoner. He knew he had to get through the Confederate line to get to the Union side. He got up with the help of his rifle, using it as a staff. He was covered in so much blood that the Confederate soldiers that he did come across didn't know that he was a Yank. Jacob said that even his captain did not recognize him once he made it back to the Union side. He even passed a brigade of Confederate soldiers, and they had no idea that he was not one of theirs. He kept going the best he could, but his head swelled so badly that it had shut both of his eyes, and the only way that he could see to keep moving was by raising the lid of his right eye and looking ahead, then going on until he ran into something. Then he would lift his eyelid again so that he could get his bearings and start moving again. He finally became so exhausted, he had to lay down by the side of the road. Eventually, some bears came along and found him and put him on their stretcher, and they took him to the field hospital where they laid him on the ground in a tent. A nurse did put a wet bandage on his head and gave him a canteen full of water. When the doctors finally examined him, it was believed that the best thing for him was not to operate. They did not believe that he would live through the night, and they did not want to cause him any more pain. Surprisingly, the doctors found him alive the next morning. That day, they were sending the wounded to Chattanooga. Jacob was told that he was hurt too badly to be moved, and if the army fell back any further, those who were left there could afterwards be exchanged. Jacob had no intention of being left behind to become a prisoner of the South. He made up his mind that as long as he could drag one foot after the other, he was not staying. He left the tent, and to move onward, he had to do what he had done the day before, lift his eyelid so that he could get his bearings of what was in front of him. One time he got off to the side of the road and bumped his head against a low hanging limb. Jacob said the shock toppled him right over. He finally got back up and started moving again, but eventually had to lay down on the roadside. Several ambulances started passing him by, the drivers asking him if he was still alive, and they would still pass, leaving him on the road. Finally, an ambulance driver took him in because one of his wounded had died and the driver had taken the body out and had room for Jacob. This is how he found himself in Chattanooga with hundreds of wounded soldiers. In Chattanooga, he ended up being reunited with two other wounded soldiers from his own regiment. They could not believe that he was alive and they told him that he had been left on the battlefield for dead. An order came that any wounded who could walk were to start across the river on a pontoon bridge to a hospital to be treated, then ready to be taken to Nashville. He told his friends that he would be able to walk the distance as long as they would lead him. On the other side of the river, they luckily ran into their company teamster. He got them something to eat and he fixed up their wounds the best he could. They rested that night under their Teamster's wagon. The next morning, they had coffee and a bite to eat of hard tack and meat fat. After Jacob and his friends walked four days to Bridgeport, Tennessee, they were able to get in a train boxcar heading to Nashville and then to the hospital. He was later transferred to Louisville, Kentucky, and from there to New Albany, Indiana. In all of the hospitals that he had been in, he begged the surgeons to operate on his head, but they all refused. After suffering for nine months, he finally got a furlough and went home to Logansport and found two doctors to operate on his wound. They took out a musket ball. 
17 years after he was shot, a buckshot dropped out of his wound. 31 years after, two more pieces of lead came out of the wound. These pictures show that Jacob lived with the wound for the rest of his life. As stated in the newspaper article, that it is believed that all of the bullet had finally fallen out at the time of the article in 1911. It was said that during the time it was in the head that there were times it would put Jacob in a stupor which might last up to two weeks, it being usually when he caught cold and produced more pressure on the brain. At other times, delirium would seize him and he would imagine himself again on picket duty and would tramp back and forth on his beat, a stick on his shoulder for a musket. Jacob did say that the only time he was not in pain was when he was asleep. Jacob left Indiana and moved to Illinois. He would marry Marjorie Peck in 1871 and they had a son, Arthur, in 1873. Being a disabled veteran, he received a pension of $40 per month. Jacob died at the age of 88 on January 12, 1927. He and his wife Marjorie are buried at the Oakwood Cemetery, Wilmington, Illinois. Thank you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed the story of Jacob Miller, a Civil War soldier from Indiana and his amazing story. Please be sure to subscribe, like, and share. Until next time.